an unusual sight these days, marching men, soldiers marching all over the world. The airborne infantry also marches, but not far this time. They're plenty tough, trained for action anywhere, ready for it any time. On the ground, they can take care of themselves and the enemy. But in the air, these men are dependent on the flight crew of the troop carrier airplane, with a good share of responsibility resting on the pilot and co-pilot. For the success or failure of a mission can depend on getting these troops to the proper place at the proper time. Handling the C-47 skillfully comes only from a thorough knowledge of the characteristics and performance of the airplane. Take a good look at this man. There was a day not so many weeks ago when he was a transition pilot. A day when he first started to learn the do's and don'ts of flying the C-47. Let's go back to that day. Here's Lieutenant Warren, a few weeks younger and a lot greener, but not too green. He knows enough to realize that the best insurance against accident is to know his airplane. That's why he's checking on the crew chief. Tires checked for blister cuts, proper inflation. Hydraulic brake lines checked for leakage. Warren has been taught that there's more to his job than just sitting down in the driver's seat. A good half of this flying business takes place long before your wheels leave the ground. Look her all over, Lieutenant. They say it's easier to check on the ground than in the air. Here comes a man who will agree with that statement. Warren's instructor, Captain Matthews. All set, Lieutenant? From top to bottom, Captain. Okay, let's go. Mind if we go along, Captain? Maybe we can pick up a few pointers. We want to see what a transition pilot learns after he's through with his groundwork. Lieutenant, what's the first thing you do in the cockpit after checking Form 1A? Flip on the battery switches. Wrong. The first thing you do is adjust your seat so that your eye level hits the center of the windshield. None of those battery switches. Landing gear next, sir? Right. Latch down and lock. Check. Pressure up 500 pounds. Check. Neutralize landing gear and flap levers. Check. Light green. Check. Horn operation. Here it is. Check. Out of pilot hydraulic valve. Off. Check. Fluid level. Okay, sir. How's the fuel supply? Left main 200. Right main 200. Left auxiliary 100. Right auxiliary 100. Total 600, sir. Good. Let's take the quadrant column now. Move the prop pitch controls back and forth to be sure they're free and leave them full forward. The same applies to the throttle. Leave them one quarter open and the mixture control return to idle cutoff. Elevator tabs should be neutral. Oil shutters in proper position. Put carburetor air temperature controls in cold position. That's to prevent damage to the induction system in case backfiring occurs on starting. Set aileron and rudder tabs at zero. Turn autopilot off. The ice is off. Parking brake on. Move cross feed valve on. Right, sir. Move static selector valve to top. 
Double check your gauge by setting your altimeter at field elevation. Uh, tap the altimeter to remove any friction. Check your tachometer and airspeed indicator for zero reading. Check your clocks. Now test the flight controls. Make certain that your rudder pedals are even and adjusted to you, and that you have free and maximum movement of the rudder. Elevator. And aileron controls. Look out the window to see whether your aileron is moving. Right, sir. Check flap indicators for up position. Engine cow flaps open. Yes, sir. Now we'll go through the starting engine check. Ready, sir. If the engines have been standing in excess of one hour, they should be pulled through by hand with the switches off. Of course. However, Major Krebs had this plane up less than an hour ago, so we can proceed accordingly. Left engine tank selector, left main. Right engine tank selector, off. Propellers in low pitch, throttles one quarter open, mixture control in idle cutoff, carburetor air cold, main ignition switch on, left ignition switch cold. Raise the fuel pressure to approximately 10 pounds per square inch with a wobble pump and keep it at that pressure. I'm going to start the left engine. With a fuel pressure at 10 pounds, momentarily move mixture control out of idle cutoff position to rich. This facilitates priming. You then operate the starters by moving left starter switch and safety switch up to start. When the starter has reached speed, pull down on both switches. Right, sir. Mesh.
Open and close the throttles gradually. Don't ever accelerate the engine fast enough to cause damage to your gear train. That'll just be for stopping to avoid brake locking or jerking the plane. And remember, Warren, don't ever turn with one wheel locked. Always keep the inside wheel moving slowly. Right, sir. Next, we'll go through the engine run-up and pop check. Warm up the engines from 800 to 1,000 RPM. Keep the prop controls in low pitch until the oil temperatures reach 40 degrees centigrade minimum. Cylinder head temperature should not exceed 232 degrees centigrade. Adjust the engine speed to 1500 RPM. Now move the left prop control from low to high pitch. No decrease in RPM and increase in the manifold pressure. serves to bring warm oil to the prop dome. After a pause of from 10 to 12 seconds, we turn the left prop control from high to low pitch. Now we'll run the left engine to 2350 RPM. At the same time, check the manifold against the RPM to make sure that both engines are putting out approximately the same power. Check both mags at 27 to 30 inches manifold pressure. The drop off from two max to either one should not exceed 75 RPM. Now you go through the same procedure with the right engine. Drop controls to high pitch. RPM decreases, manifold pressure increases. Turn to low pitch. Throttle, run up to 2350. Check manifold pressure and RPM. Check both mags at 27 to 30 inches. Drop off from both mags to one. Should not exceed 75 RPM. It all checks, sir. That's fine, Lieutenant. Now go through the takeoff check. You will select your mains. Mixture rich, carburetor heat full cold, oil shutter okay, trim tabs neutral, the icer valve off, prop full low, high RPM, cross speed valve off, cow flat, trail, wing flaps, up. Check for freedom of flight controls. Generators on. Set gyros. As co-pilot, here are your takeoff duties. Watch the pressure instruments. Be ready to use the wobble pump whenever necessary. As soon as the manifold reaches takeoff limits, apply additional tension to the throttle locking mechanism. Also, guard the throttles from creeping back like this. Check RPMs. I'll give you the signal when to retract the landing gear, and as soon as your wheels are up and the red light indicates the retracted position and the landing gear pressure dial shows zero, return the landing gear valve to neutral. You got it? On the beam, sir. Oh, and, uh, uh, let me know if you spot any irregularities in the engine or instrument. All right, call the tower.
to zero. Neutral. Bottle back to 35 inches manifold.
control set to auto rich. Car flaps in trail position. Hydraulic system to good engine. 
But just power so that RPM is increased by 100 for every two inches of manifold pressure used above 30 inches. Use minimum power required. If more than maximum rated horsepower is necessary, put prop control in full low pitch. I notice you keep the plane at about 120 miles an hour. That's the recommended cruising speed. During single engine flight with any appreciable power being used, control can't be maintained below 85 miles per hour. Best results are obtained if the fuselage is held parallel to the line of flight. What's the reason for dropping the wing on the live engine side three degrees? Because I want to counteract the skidding effect of the rudder force. This attitude produces minimum drag and maximum cruising speed with a given power. Catch on? Yeah, I get it. But to keep all that stuff in your head, you sure have to be a walking check order. Or a flying one. But don't worry, Warren. When you get out of it, you'll be able to feather a prop or adjust to one motor in a matter of seconds. Now, but there are about 20 steps to go through. All right, figure a second for each step. It took me longer just now because I was explaining it to you as I went along. Here, I'll unfeather the prop and show you what I mean. In unfeathering, with throttle closed and prop and decrease, you switch the ignition to both. Check. Make sure mixture control is an idle cutoff. Turn engine fuel tank selector to desired tank. And push the feathering button and hold until the prop windmills to between 600 and 800 RPM. is pretty much the same as landing without flaps. But when you're certain you'll make it out of the field, lower your flaps. Keep your airspeed at 95 to 100 on approach. Then when you're ready to land, your rudder flatness should be returned two to three degrees from neutral. Then it's regular procedure. Gear down. before we can taxi. RPM to cool the engines below 180 degrees centigrade. Now you know the next step. Reach for 418.
that you kept the flaps down after contact with the ground. But two schools of thought on that. But some pilots spill them. I leave them down to serve as an air brake. They also help to retard the forward roll. That was the first day for Lieutenant Warren. His introduction to the C-47. He came to know that ship a lot better in the days that followed. Got to know the inside of that cockpit so he could reach for every control with the familiarity of a skilled carpenter reaching for his tools of trade. He came to know and trust those instruments on the panel in front of him as real friends who, when understood, can help make flying the C-47 more of a pleasure than a job. Yes, piling up those necessary hours of transition training taught Lieutenant Warren many things. Safety in the air and on the ground became a matter of habit. Little things like checking to see if the crew chief had locked the rudder, elevator, and ailerons became important things to this man, whom so many others would soon depend upon. You remember where we first met him. Let's put him right back up there, in the cockpit of that C-47 where he belongs. He and his co-pilots, twin custodians of the lives of these men. They've got to be good, these pilots of the Troop Carrier Command. They've got to be good to fulfill the command's motto. He conquers who gets there first. <laughs> 